you will write it in it, and with end band, we do write uh, something called end band in it, and we pass in some parameters. And these are the parameters to download your file, and then it can work out the backend name from your username and your host name, and also um, oh, based on the version you tell it to download, it will download that. So um, we will just initialize this project. And if you were to manage any environments using automation, it's not, it's not actually, let's do step one, let's do step two, let's do step three. With automation, it's let's set up all the parameters for our environment, and we'll push the button to see it go. But um, if you're managing an, an environment, pushing that button is not hard. The hard part is setting up those parameters and making sure that they are correct. And so if you want to be confident in pressing that button, first you want to know what's the current state of my environment, where am I bringing that environment to, if I were to push that button, what's the cost between the current state and the desired, the deployed state, and once you have all of this information surfaced to you, then you might be confident in pressing that button. And so what we have with Endman, just like Git has Git status, shows you the status of your repository, Endman has Endman's status, shows you the current state of your process you're managing. So you've got an application download, this file doesn't exist, our S3 bucket doesn't exist, and our S3 object, we don't know the state of the object in the bucket which doesn't exist. So that's why you can't compute it. If you want to know the state of, um, you, if you want to know what the deployment would do, we should tell you before we actually do it. So you, you actually know where go, you're going. So infinite desire is um, just that. So our application download step will um, <coughs> download this file containing six megs. And our S3 bucket, uh, this bucket name should exist. So before you actually run the automation, you know what's going to happen. And if you have things mostly created, just a few things out of sync, you can actually run the diff command as well. So just like git diff is the diff between two file contents, infinite diff is the diff between the objects where each step is being managed. So what's the difference between two buckets? Or the bucket states? The bucket doesn't exist, the bucket does exist. That's the diff. And if you had a file which changed, you might see um, it will change from maybe six megs to seven megs. So you, at least you get something a bit more semantically meaningful. And once we're confident in our in our button, we'll press it. So that's what we'll do today. And I will just click right up, so it's a bit easier to see. All right. So here we can see uh, steps one, two, three each thing uh, in our process that we are managing. And I hope you can also see that it's very easy to map A, B, and C to the one, two, and three here, right? And by presenting the information in the right form and with the right level of detail, so we don't display everything, um, it's a lot easier to map between the concepts and, the, and what you see on screen. And so this is communication to the end user of an automation tool. And of course, just like any good automation, we shall clean up after ourselves. Now, back here, that's the bottom workflow where we take care of the user. Today, we're going to look at the top workflow where we take care of the developer writing the automation. All right, so for our developer, when you are going to write an automation tool, you tend to know what the process looks like in concept. And for each process, you should know the steps conceptually, and then you want to encode that into code. So for, for piece, instead of calling steps steps, we call them items. And the reason why we call these items is for every step in the process, we don't just have the work to do the logic. We have we have um, logic to read the current state, read the state that it would be when I press a button without writing to that state, um, compute the diff between two states, and also um, what's a clean up state. And with all of these 
um, read functions, you can pair that finally with your work function to do the automation. And because it's so, uh, it's a lot, a lot of information, so we don't want to call it step, we call it item. And the other thing we have to also um, include in our workflow is what's ordering between these items. So if you look into the code here, um, so that's good. So lines 6 through 10, you'll see that we declare our items, and in line 12 we declare um, the order. So that's um, A to B and B to C, which clearly maps to the concept. So you can go from the concept to the code, and if you just have the code and not the concept, you can also go from the code to the concept. So that's how we communicate clearly to the developer. And of course, you can have nonlinear ordering. So instead of going from A to B, you can write A to C and B to C, which gives you this parallelization. Cool. So maybe go. Okay. So once we have our items in our process, we also need to define how data gets passed into these items, as well as um, through them. Now, if you work with any automation using shell scripts or some YAML derivative, so like half motion, you'll find that the data type you use tends to be string, string, and string. And if you are, if you're not a dev here, string, using strings everywhere is like saying, I grab some stuff, I do some stuff, and out came some stuff. It's not very clear what you're actually doing. Whereas if I said, I grab my camera, I take a shot, and I can photograph. Then the picture is much clearer. Right? You, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so that's what we want to do with um, this framework. And so instead of using string, 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 we'll use types. So we, we give them a name, and that's how you have the types. Right? So, um, so if we use types and a compiler, and a compiled language, then we will get compiler support to know when we pass the wrong thing into the wrong thing. And hopefully we know we can pass the right thing to the right thing. Right. So because piece is a framework, each of these items can be defined by a different party, so a different company, a different person, and publish. Which means the input type and the output type for each item is API. Now, um, in order to have strong typing, the framework needs to know what the type is for the input and the output. And we call the input parameters and we call the output state so that um, we have consistent, well, everyone can publish what the API types are. And here we have a really short example for the file download. The parameters type is the file download parameters, the output type is the file download state. And the definition of each of those, the file download parameters, you need a URL to where to fetch a file, and the destination uh, where to write the file to on disk, that's both input. For the file download state, that's the output type. Um, either the file doesn't exist on disk, or it does with um, where it lives and also a hash of the contents. So with the output, you don't have to load the entire file to memory. You just need to have enough information in the state to compare between two different states. Right. So when we know our input and output types, we also need to define the values that go in to them and pass between them. So um, there's, there's this tricky, um, there's this tricky concept where if I'm writing a framework, I might, um, well, an automation tool developer might want to say, use the output of step two to feed into the input of step three. So for example, if I was, instead of uploading to an S3 bucket, I was uploading to a server, then I wouldn't know the IP address of that server before, before the server is created, if it were to be generated by my cloud provider, for example. So, we want to simulate that um, requirement by saying, whenever step two is completed, it will produce a certain output, and we want to wire that output into the parameter of step three. 
Okay, so over here we've got some parameter um, types and for values that we know at the start of the automation, you can say that, all right, I know you should download from this URL, I know you should, you should uh, write to this file path, and this is the bucket name to use. But for the final step, if you were to wire a value produced by step two into step three, we need some way to encode that deferred logic into whatever we tell the framework. And so this deference, we, the framework will generate a type called the parameter specification. And that's where we record this deferred logic. So for the S3 object parameters, step three, you can pass in um, step values if you know them. But for values that you don't know, we've got this with bucket name from map, and, the, and you provide a mapping function. And in the mapping function, this is just Rust logic, which uh, you, you can define functions on the fly. And you, you tell it, grab the S3 bucket state, which is the output type of step two. And if the bucket doesn't exist, then we don't know the bucket name to use. But if the bucket does exist, then just grab its name. And the most amazing thing about this is it's type safe. And I'll show you why it is amazing. So this this is the literal code for it. Where are we? Down here. Alright. Let's read back state um bigger. Cool. So if I were to pass in Instead of the correct type, so bucket name here for S3 object parameters, it happens to be a string, so so much for strong typing. But let's say I call this a path path as well. In a matter of seconds, I get feedback from my compiler that I've fed in the wrong type of value, and crucially, crucially, I actually spent a lot of effort into this. I made the compiler tell the developer the trait function. Option path path is not implemented for your closure. So the first uh, type parameter to in this error message communicates to the developer, you're, you're meant to give me an option, um, an optional path, which is the type of the bucket name. And um, you've given me, well, you've given me whatever this is, which happens to be a string. And so if I were to correct the type back to a string, then my compilation error goes away. And the value of this is if you, if you were to write this in some sort of shell or YAML uh, script, then what you get, well, if you make a mistake, you have to deploy your automation to discover that mistake. And it's like, instead of one second feedback, it's tens of minutes, right? Because your automation is not just the step that you change, but all the steps before it. And you have to clean up and start again every time you make any mistake. Whereas if you have immediate feedback, you don't even have to leave your code to know what went wrong. And yes, you can. You can say, instead of just step two's output mapping into step three, I can grab step one's output, but um, I'll, I'll just simulate it using a number for now. If step one produced a number, <coughs> then I can use that number to compute the value for step three. And you can see that, again, if I make a mistake, I will get immediate feedback. So you want to use size from the new 32, and that means, well, I made a mistake here. Come on, come back. Okay, so use size, and if I see my reference that, then it will compile because I have satisfied the compiler's constraints. So that's, we'll get all back. Ah, my Andrew has messed up. I think we're good. Okay, so the, uh, uh, this is called parameter specification, and it's a big um, safety net for developers uh, who are just defining how to wire values through your code. Yeah, cool. So once we have all, once we have all our logic as well as the values to pass between each item, we also need to define a way to present that to the user. So Peace is very deliberate in separating the logic code from the presentation code. So if you have automation which does stuff, um, you can present it as a command line interface, uh, in a command line interface, this is real, um, and you can present it in a non 
interact with the model interface, such as for your build server. And if you had a web API, you could uh, return JSON. Or if you had um, a nice uh, looking web page, you could do that as well. Uh, this is a field. All right, and how do developers choose which output they want? They just choose the type. You can just yes, go, I want to see a lot of outputs. Oh, I want. Um, we've got some fake outputs, like the middle of output just discards all information about your execution. And there's the function tracker, which I'm using test to make sure um, certain code calls the output, um, the output from the implementation. So that's, that's for our assertions. And you can write your own. So with, um, with, with a piece, we provide a trait called output rights. Traits are just like interfaces in other languages. So you can just provide your own implementation and pass that in. But of course, output tends to be common functionality. So we do want to provide as much of that as possible. Okay, so now we have quite a lot of information and we just need to invoke some commands. So we have our, our items to, in our process, the order between those items, we have our wiring of data and we have our presentation. So we need to group these together and then do something. So our grouping, um, uh, our grouping type is called command context, or CMD CTX for short. And we, we plug in the output, we plug in the um, flow. The flow is the items plus the ordering. And we plug in the item uh, parameters. And those are actually parameters of steps. Yeah, but it doesn't matter what they are allowed to name. All right, so we plug all of those into the command context. And if you want to write any, or if you want to implement any command, you can um, just call one of the pre-written uh, piece commands. So implement status, behind the scenes calls state saved read command. So state saved read command means previously I've actually discovered the current state, and state saved just means let's surface what we saved before to the user. Instead of always um, discovering and because discovery can take um, seconds to maybe minutes, and so we want to store what we've discovered before and quickly surface that to the user. And there is a separate um, state dis discover command if you actually want to discover. To apply the automation, you can call ensure commands. And all of these, um, of course, we try to make the APIs quite consistent, so it should be quite easy to uh, figure out what to plug in. So, um, when I was writing this tool in Kanban, I realized really, really quickly the first command I plugged in was Kanban init with all my parameters. But to run Kanban status with, without any parameters, I still needed to construct a command context with all of those parameter specs. But that means I needed to save those parameters I passed in the first time so that the second invocation of the command the tool, because it's a separate process, I need to read what I'm um, passing the first time. I don't have that in memory. Right? So because this is a common thing, I thought, OK, the, the framework should do it. The framework should remember what I'm about to pass into it. And whatever the developer calls the next time, we will automatically load what was passed into us the first time. So we, we do exactly that. You have to do nothing to your command context, exactly the same code, it just stores it for you. But the second time you construct a command context, you don't actually have to pass in the parameter specifications. And the reason for that is we default to first loading whatever we had before. And if we had nothing before, then we will cry because we don't know what to do. But um, for, for the S3 object parameters, uh, step three of the initial process. Because there's a mapping function, we can't actually serialize mapping logic to disk and load it back from disk into the automation tool the second time around. So we can, we can write something to disk, but we can't turn it back into logic. Because to do that, we would have to ship a Rust compiler or ship some scripting engine. And I mean, that could be a good way of sprinting Rust around, right? <laughs> but um, in, in um, for, for usage, it's not really good to just ship something quite heavy to the user. 
So the approach Peace has taken for now is whenever you pass us a mapping function, you do need to pass us a mapping function for subsequent invocations. And so we will load everything that you passed us before. But because of this limitation, we do need you to pass us the mapping function subsequently as well. And we, we know that code evolves. And because it initially, in the first invocation of um, let's, let's create a command context, we can easily change this code to now provide a mapping function the first time and forget to change the second command context building, which means the, the developer might forget to pass this in. So because we can't make this a compile error, what we have done in piece is if we forget, or if the developer forgets to pass us the method function the second time, let me just go here. So this is my second invocation. Build, yeah, it's, um, that's me forgetting to use it. So when I run this, my tool gives me a runtime error, and it's not a stack trace of the I, I just crashed. It's it's a it's an error code. You can just use the craft TV, but it says item parameter specifications do not match with the items in the flow. Um, so the following items either have not had a parameter specification passed to uh, provide previously, or have contained a mapping function, which cannot be loaded from this. So we actually communicate through the runtime error that this is what the problem is. And we actually tell the uh, developer the parameter spe specifications needs to be provided to the command context for this S3 object. So we tell them how to recover. So it's a lot better to have a way forward rather than crash and then something's wrong but we're not going to tell you what. Right? It's a lot better to actually lead someone forward to the right solution. So yes, we take care of the developer at runtime if we cannot do it compile time. All right, so do that back. You might want to build it. Okay, back to our pop. Yeah, so here's just some code saying um, the parameter specification for step three. We don't need to provide the file path or object key anymore because those can be loaded from this, but the mapping function does need to be provided to us. Okay, so workspace. Um, if you ever run git status in a subdirectory of your repository, it still finds where that .git directory lives. So workspace is just that. So piece needs to know where, where's my root of the project? And um, for this, because it stores information about each execution and for uh, like the states, and later on, we want to have some analysis for averages of timing for each step's execution because we can provide good feedback that way. So, to, to, to start all of this, we need to have a .piece directory and we need the developer to tell us where does this piece directory live. And well, where, where's the workspace root? And we can provide um, three ways they can tell us. One, the current working directory of your executable, or you can give us a path um, directly. Or the third variant, um, find the first directory of my tree with this file name, and we'll, we'll use the parent of that directory. So it's easy for the developer to tell us what they want. They don't have to implement it for us, as long as we follow it first. This is the last <laughs> So profiles. Now the most confident way, um, well, the, the way you can be most confident that software works is to run it. And if you want to run some software in front in a production environment with, with your customer's data and stuff, you probably want to run it in a few environments before that. So development, testing, and maybe multiple of these. And once you're super confident that your software is like full group, then you run it in chart. Now, the, <coughs> these replica environments, um, Peace handles them by, um, by giving them names, and these names are called profiles. So you can have your development one profile, one, two, test, 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 uh, one, two, three. And you can actually 
have very similar looking things in, um, in different environments. And this um, makes it a lot easier for developers to work with multiple environments. Because if you just use a tool like, say, CloudFormation, you have to write that profile separation yourself between um, like dev and test part. But um, Peace gives you some support for this. So every time you build a run context, you have to tell it, um, well, there's something called multiple profiles and multiple flows, but um, for now, you can um, tell it, let's create a single profile and it should be single flow. Um, there is something called no flow as well, but um, we ask the user or developer to tell us what profile should we run this as. And the first invocation of any command, you need to tell us the profile. And you can also tell us where to save it. Because in subsequent commands, like end-to-end status we saw earlier, we don't actually request the user to pass in the current, stuff, uh, the current profile name. We want to recall that from the last invocation. It's just like git branches, you don't actually tell git the branch you want the status from. You, you tell git my active branch is whatever it is, and then git status will automatically remember which um, branch it's on. So there's some support for this. And um, yeah, the code here just shows that subsequent ex executions, you just pass in, I want to use the profile from whatever I used before. And there's a short demo for this, maybe, maybe not so short. So man profile. So apparently we are on, um, we're currently on profile number one, the demo one, and environment type is development. So we can go and then um, profile list. That will show us we've only got one profile. If, if you use git, uh, you can go git switch and create a new branch. We have a similar thing here. So we've got git um, endman switch demo two, and you can tell it to create it. Let's make it um, production and version web app one point two. And here I can go and then deploy. And you can see that I've deployed the environment for profile two. And if I were to uh, and then switch to demo one, so and then status for demo one would is not existent, and I could deploy this as well. And once you have multiple profiles de deployed, you tend to want to go. All right, I've got a production environment, I've got a development environment. What's the difference between the two? Can I compare two environments together? Maybe, maybe it's a customer, customer environment, customer production environment. You want to know what's the difference between the two. So remember how we had end to end diff? Instead of diffing files, we can diff objects. So if I pass in demo two and demo one as the environments I want to diff, it will show me that um, the files have changed from 6.5 megs to 6.4 megs. And the bracket names different for demo two and demo one. So you can see the object diff. And I know this is quite um, shallow level diffing because intentionally we reduce the level of detail that we present to the user when it is um, when they are using the tool just to get quick information. If you really want to have the detailed information, we do store that for you. Um, so delta is my uh, diff tool I use, and you can you can see um, in the uh, state that we save in Endman that the values and um, this has changed from GitHub uh, some URL 1.2 to uh, GitHub some URL 1.1. So that's um, you can have your attribute level diffing as well. But if you don't need that level of detail, if you just want to have enough information to go what um, what's the the business level. Uh, diff between two environments, version one and uh, version one or two. That's that's enough for me to make a decision. And if I really needed to go to the technical detail, yes, it's possible. And yes, we had to carefully engineer the sorting of the states to make sure that you actually get a semantically useful diff rather than having a missing shift up somewhere else. Right. So all of the little things that you be annoyed at if you're a dev. Because I know it from the dev point of view, I can at least help when creating from the framework point of view. Cool, so yeah, you can see environment. 
that you can mess up. So and you could you could run multiple commands over multiple environments, and it just um, it's just easy to do that because the interface requires very few parameters to to do what we want to do. So this doesn't matter. Clean up for both of the um, environments. Cool. So, in summary, how do we communicate clearly in code? One, consistency between the concept and the code. Two, make, make use of type safety, because that's how you can surface um, the difference really quickly. The compiler helps you uh, communicate. When you require something of the developer, make sure it's easy for them to tell us. So it shouldn't have too much syntax for them to tell us the semantics. And prefer errors at compile time instead of runtime, because that shortens the feedback loop. It helps the developer stay in the flow. And finally, error messages should show what is wrong and how to fix it as much as possible. Because it's, it's hard when you see something wrong and it doesn't want to fix it. <laughs> right. So I'd just like to end with this note that um, empathy is about connecting with your, um, your people. And whether you're using verbal communication, uh, visual communication, or in code, you need to find your voice and commun communicate with clarity to whoever's listening. And that way you can connect with them. Thank you for listening. So you don't have to write any parallelization code. 
Cool. That's that's awesome. Well, that's just like my question is more of the presentation here. So I was just <laughs> interested like you can it would be nice if you like do some like like the Git tree kind of uh, oh, um, you know to to see that one like uh, one and start uh, in parallel, you know. Yeah, so um, this is the command line version of that. The web version is in development, but you can see this. So very early days, <laughs> this is generated by the code, grab this graph, and I was playing with Tailwind, so you're meant to be able to hover and click on these items to see the, the state and the progress. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the, where's my presentation, here we go. You, you're meant to be able to see this, this green thing means it's done. The blue thing means it's in progress, right? Very, very clear uh, communication to whoever's using it. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So thank you for for the talk and to the spark and it's like it's very cool. Um so um, like this tool reminds me of tools like Terraform, for example, where you create like a sort of bubble or super kind of state. One issue I'm facing when I'm using Terraform is that um, it thinks of all of the items of like equal importance and I cannot set the abstraction there. Like right? so for example in my current job I can like, define a set of resources that is like a specific sub system and I employ like fifty of them. And when I change something and I get like a 2,000 white combined data saying everything has changed. Uh, but I don't know how to express this, but I feel like I want to, to set up like abstraction layers instead of saying something like every item is the same, maybe just say that like, like front hand part has changed mm -hmm. and I don't really care what the minor things have changed. Yeah, so how would that be? Considering yeah. it's all the graph. But is there any tools that do that? So I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, an example of how we do this in PC. So you know how um, I say that over here, we, we try to limit the output so that it's quite clear to the user for each item. We separate the presentation from the, from the um, automation by saying to present this, to present this piece of data, because data is the thing that you're kind of looking at the state, right? You tell, you tell a presenter, presenter, I am a list, or I am an item with these things. And the presenter can be configured to go, I'm going to present at this level of detail, which means even though I'm told to present these as um, attributes of this main item, if you configure the presenter to go, show me the highest level of detail possible, then it's going to drop all of the lower level fields, which means your, the information that you present to the user is going to be a lot um, less, uh, lot, a lot fewer attributes, a lot less dense. Right? So that way, you're, you're not overwhelmed with information. So the developer of the tool needs to implement it that way? Um, so the framework provides constraints, and so the data type itself doesn't say this is how you present me. Oh, well, it doesn't say this is the string to present. The data type says, all right, I've been given a presenter, and I'll tell the present, the data type tells the presenter, um, present me as an inline code, or present me as a profile, actually. I'm gonna show you status. So status, using profile demo two, that's color and type production. Um, the, the data type for production is actually environment type, and it says, present me as inline code. And whichever presenter is active at the moment, could be command line presenter, which would present you in back text. It could be an HTML presenter, which puts um, the tags around that. The, if you tell the presenter, if, if you ever get any requests for a lot of detail, drop the lowest level of detail. And so it's configurable at the automation tool layer how much detail to present. Yeah, um, it's it's still uh, you still need to write the, the presenter to be configurable to have different levels of detail. And this means that presenter actually 